So I'll start on behalf of both Patrick and I by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands upon which everyone is situated today who's either here or, or listening online and extend that respect to elders past and present. We're here to talk about, oh, one other little shout out I wanted to give is to our research fellow, Amy Young, who assisted us in pulling this presentation together. So we're here to talk about the Disrupting Violence Beacon. I need to go through slides. Um, which is, as Louise mentioned, um, a program of research that's been funded by the university. Its, it's name actually, Disrupting Violence, reflects the um, values and also the input and views of key Aboriginal um, leaders within our university. And it was decided that rather than calling it, you know, stopping violence or, um, I don't know, um, violence no more, we really wanted to reflect the fact that we're here, that the program of research is focused on disrupting narratives and disrupting things that occur in relation to violence. So the beacon aims, and, and I use the term beacon because that's what these programs of research have been, I guess, named within the university, but people outside of, outside of the university may not get that. So really think about when I say beacon, <laughs> it's really about a program of research. So it aims to undertake um, innovative research on violence, creating knowledge that can be used to develop effective violence prevention strategies and also interventions. And it, it's ultimately aiming to build and, and support institutions and systems that improve access to justice. It has a broad focus looking at violence, you know, across interpersonal, family, community, state and global levels and examines the ways the cycle of violence impacts and inter interacts with structural disadvantage and discrimination. The focus can be broadly broken into three main themes, and that is understanding violence, translation and innovation, and also access to justice, which together, we hope, will focus on how justice institutions in domestic and international contexts um, will address gender, race, conflict and human security. Today, what we, Patrick and I aim to do is highlight the connections between the beacon and today's topic of reasoning, reasoning and reckoning. Um, and, by do, and we do that by understanding how past narratives such as those held by Samuel Griffith continue to impact access to justice and current social issues. And how we, through hopefully um, research that can um, highlight these things, but also help address them, disrupt those narratives. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we start by um, highlighting a quote, and this quote on the, on the screen came as Samuel Griffith stood down from his position um, on the High Court of Australia due to ill health and was chosen, we've chosen it to illustrate how the work of our legal systems can be separated by lawmakers from social reality. It can be seen their work, I guess, can be seen as being non-biased and non, non -influen not influenced by <laughs> cultural narratives. We need to ask how we can hold the dissonance of past positive aspects of Griffith's legacy, such as the fact that he um, implemented free compulsory and secular education in Queensland, and also to some extent codifying the criminal law in Queensland with the role he played in the lives of marginalised groups in Australia. We'll be looking at this issue through, through the examples of Samuel Griffith's legacy, where his actions have been influenced by or influenced harmful narratives not to excuse his responsibility in acting on these racist social narratives, but understanding them so that we can disrupt their influence. So we're going to use five examples, which are listed um, up on the screen as our focus. The first being Griffith's legacy of immigration detention. Secondly, his legacy on Chinese Australians. 
Thirdly, the silencing of women's power and truth-telling and the politicisation of sexuality. Fourthly, his role in controlling Pacific Islander labour in Queensland. And lastly, his legacy on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Prince and Lester's essay in Griffith Review highlights the ongoing links between Samuel Griffith's God's power of provision and how this has been used in immigration detention cases. In particular, even recently, such as Novak Djokovic's case earlier this year. So the case of Novak Djokovic drew international attention to Australia's use of prolonged detention. As has been mentioned um, by Henry Reynolds, as inaugural Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia and also one of the key you know, leaders and, and um, people who had great input in the Australian Constitution or in the drafting of the, the Constitution, Samuel Griffith played a role in constructing these laws and adjudicating the scope of the Commonwealth's power to make laws with respect to aliens who were non-citizens and make God powers conceivable. God powers were foundational to the white Australia policy and have led to rules being arbitrar arbitrarily decided. Rules that, you know, suggest that whatever we as, as lawmakers decide they will be and can be applied to whoever, whoever they choose to be applied to. Prince and Lester's focus on the 1906 High Court decision of, of Robolton, and I'll never be able to pronounce this name properly, but Robolton's and Brennan, authorising the mass deportation of Australian South Sea Islander community members because his, his role, Griffith's role as Chief Justice, said it was indisputable that they were aliens, was um, took until 2020 for the, for the High Court to recognise that the term aliens is racialised. And it was acknowledged only recently that this was the case in relation to Aboriginal people in Australia. This approach in defining what is alien is contra to Australia's human rights obligations as signatory to various treaties and conventions and means that anyone classed as an alien can be detained regardless of personal circumstances and regardless if they are a danger to community. It places people at the whims of social narratives and allows legal judgments to be made based on whether we like them or not. The quote that's on, currently on the screen suggests that Samuel Griffith's just judgments weren't influenced by political, sociological or personal biases. However, as we know, social narratives, some of which are still apparent in current discourse, influenced his use of the term alien and its application to those he saw as being other. As Prince and Lester note, Griffith needed to be reminded when he was the Attorney General of Queensland that Chinese settlers from areas such as Hong Kong were British subjects and as such had the right to protection. Griffith and his opponent McElwraith Wraith both used anti-Chinese rhetoric in their 1988 election campaign both stating that they were running on a platform of ousting the Chinese from Brisbane. Newspapers already contained anti-Chinese sentiment. So it didn't take much for riots to break, to break out on election day on the 5th of May when an argument between a Chinese storemaker or store, sorry, storekeeper and McElwaith supporter escalated into a four hour riot through Chinatown. The police didn't intervene because they found that the majority of people who, involved, who were involved in the riot were respectable citizens. Shop fronts were smashed and any Chinese person on Mary or Albert streets were chased and harassed. And despite lodging a claim for damages, the shopkeepers were not um, compensated by the government. These narratives, of course, continue. And this slide shows how this is the case. So Firstly, the politicising of um, fear of China and Chinese Australians, with the first image being from the Queensland paper in 1988, and the second from the federal election campaign this year. Chinese culture is still positioned as a threat to the Australian way of life, 
and a narrative that impacts Australian Chinese who face ongoing harassment. And that's evident at the moment, particularly with um, the, the newspaper reports on the um, Chinese and Solomon Islands security deals and how they've, um, you know, expressed how that might be a danger to Australia. So I'll pass over to Patrick now. So, um, thanks very much, uh, Eleanor. Um, so, just continuing this focus, uh, I'm going to focus first of all on gender. Um, and particularly um, the silence that is evident that in, in the, sh not being a historian, but in the, the reading and research that, that we did, that Griffith uh, was silent in mentioning gender. Often, um, especially in relation to women's rights. Despite the, the, the women's move, movement to uh, propose a vote across Australia at the time, Griffith appears silent on the right to vote and on East Queensland's uh, government passing of the Property Act, which, uh, he, he, uh, which allowed uh, women to uh, acquire property, property and dispose of property independent of their husbands. One of the most notable achievements in, in, in codifying Queensland criminal code uh, was Griffiths, um, which was then used as a guide in multiple countries such as Nauru, Fiji, Nigeria, and Bermuda, Bermuda, and other states in Australia, including WA and Tasmania. Um, the, the Queensland criminal code criminalised abortion and homosexual acts. It includes provisions for lawful correction of children by teachers and parents, thus allowing for the physical punishment of children um, recognised by law. It's interesting today that we still have debates that emerge about how we unravel laws in relation to issues such as sexual violence and domestic violence that have a disproportionate impact on women and vulnerable communities. Issues such as mistaken fact um, most often disadvantage women in cases of sexual violence. The Queensland Criminal Code defined rape as excluding anyone who was in a married relationship up until 1989 in Queensland um, and when, when it was first uh, criminalised as marital rape. The legacy of criminalisation of homosexual conduct in the Queensland Criminal Code is that it has been used on the basis of other, still used on the basis of other legal systems throughout the Pacific um, and British colonies, um, for example, in Africa. Uh, homose homosexual conduct was decriminalised in Queensland in 1991 and um, almost a hundred years after Griffith's Code had been introduced. And whilst that has happened in Queensland, not that long ago, um, this law is still used in other countries to criminalise homos homosexual conduct based on Griffith's work in jurisdictions such as Nigeria and Papua New Guinea. The Queensland Criminal Code is certainly not the only document or doctrine that influenced the ongoing suppression of legal, legal rights for sexual minorities, women, indigenous people in these ju jurisdictions. However, its legacy needs to be recognised both as a double-edged sword in many cases. Griffith's work um, particularly in relation to Pacific Island labour in Queensland between 1963 and 1904 is covered by mayors writing about Melanesian workers who were um, given the name Blackburning. Uh, they, the workers were brought to Queensland as in, endeavoured labourers, what we might call bonded labour in terms of slavery, in sugar and cotton industries 
Up to 62,500 South Sea Islanders were involved in this. During Griffith's time in Queensland politics, the use of labour was disputed. Um, the want of cheap labour, influenced by white men and owned by white men. However, it was recognised that white men should not do tasks that were perceived as degrading or, mini, uh, uh, or minor. Some issues remain in Australia today in our reliance on migrant labour. This history has been brought back to public conversations recently following comments by Scott Morrison stating that there was no slavery in Australia in response to Black Lives Matter marches of uh, 2020, despite numerous reports to the contrary. Economic justification for low pay and unfair conditions of migrant workers continues today in Australia, especially since the international border closures of the, of the pandemic. News reports uh, from the ABC recently in the Wide Bay area um, highlighted that workers from the Pacific still face considerable unfair conditions uh, and schemes hosted in Australia. Pay, pay may not cover their expenses when coming to work, leaving them little to send home to families. Pun punitive punishments, for example, one report uncovered at that time that workers were fined $500 if they drank alcohol out of work and there were bans on having relationships with others, often in unclean and, and overcrowded living conditions. Griffith's views on Melanesian workers uh, to work in sugar fields differed from other leading Liberals of the time, adding to this complexity of his position on different issues. Griffith ordered a Royal Commission into the use of Pacific Island labour and tried to improve conditions through the Pacific Islander Pro Protection Act of 1880 and terminated the introduction of Islander labour after 1890. However, this fits in contrast to his in inaction on Indigenous rights at the time, where the estimates of 20,000 uh, to uh, indigenous people killed by private citizens and more than 40,000 by native mounted police were reported and largely Griffith remained silent. So in standing in this space, we, we've acknowledged today and numerous speakers have acknowledged the position of Aboriginal people in relation to Samuel Griffith. Uh, Henry Reynolds is comprehensive in his criticism of Griff Griffith's inaction to protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living in Queensland, Queensland in the late 1800s through his inaction in upholding and enforcing laws. The narrative that we see tangled with Griffith's decision making are familiar today, a lack of responsibility for Indigenous Queensland and Australians for a belief that white law is the only law of the land. So putting Aboriginal people in a position where they must follow colonial laws, but these same laws were not acted upon to protect them. And the belief that Aboriginal people were a vulnerable or assimilating race. Little effort has been made to recognise by Samuel Griffin let, let alone comprehend at the time that Aboriginal people had a history long um, before uh, the invasion. A civil society with processes and laws that processed and dealt with civil and social problems. Queensland at this time continued to push it, its frontier and with its conflict uh, hundreds and thousands of Indigenous Australians were killed. During this period, Reynolds refers to Griffith not as a not only as complicit in allowing this to occur, but as personally responsible. Uh, Aboriginal 
people in Queensland had a right not to be killed. If they were, it, would, it should be considered murder. This rule was not upheld. Uh, Denbrough, in this quote, reflects on the cultural uh, continuities of colonial violence, including the current practices in, the, in our criminal justice system here in Australia, and particularly Queensland. Education systems, child protection systems, and mental health systems. In reflecting on his relationship with his great grandfather, he calls for us not to only view the past with a sense of moral uh, superiority, especially given the ongoing challenges, but to challenge that moral superiority, to stand within our own power, to use our power to change that narrative. In the same way, this recognises our own accountability as non-Indigenous Australians to build strength and integrity in how we retell stories, how we recognise history. And it's an integral value to moving forward. It's not simply, I think someone raised earlier that, I think Fiona at the beginning, that truth, truth telling only offers so much. It requires action. In, in many ways, Australia is standing at a time um, uh, in the ruins that have emerged from both the pandemic and years of uh, ignoring things such as the Illawarra Statement, where we can emerge from this room with some hope and, and a rising hope of national leadership and creating change to rebuild and uh, certainly from the last presentation, an architecture that can disrupt the dominant narratives. So, in thinking about this, it's really important is how, how do we disrupt these narratives and act? The hope of upcoming referendum responding to the Uluru Statement of the Heart gives Australians time to reflect on the Constitution and those who have contributed to it and their beliefs and narratives, which are still influencing the lives of all Australians. Truth-telling is an important part of the Uluru Statement and events such as this allow us to engage in much-needed conversations about our past. Reynolds suggests that Griffith University as an organisation is best placed to reckon with Griffith's legacy, suggesting that Griffith criminologists, for example, uh, could in integrate um, his uh, legal career as part of that legacy, as part of that reckoning. As a, as new, as a new research beacon, uh, begins, guided by human rights framework, how do we reckon with Griffith's legacy? How, how are we guided? We recognise that there's, one way, there's, there's more than one way to disrupt violence. But part of this is understanding and combating the beliefs and narratives that underline its use and justification. How do we disrupt this? We've highlighted some narratives that continue to drive violence today, including the belief that one person can have power to decide on whether people fleeing violence can enter Australia and stay in Australia. Influenced by narratives of who belongs and who is Australian and who doesn't, who isn't worthy, and whose lives are valued more. The belief of economic expediency is placed above the well-being of others here, and the belief that anyone who is non-white is a threat to white Queensland is still influencing Australia today. The colonial violence is continuing, and action must be taken to the present. Some of my experience in the past um, with truth-telling and people giving private testimonies at the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse told me the power of truth-telling and the potential for healing here. But uh, what happens after the truth-telling? Is something survivors of violence often ask? And it's something I'm very interested in, in following up with survivors, many of them, 
who are Indigenous Australians who would suffer child sexual abuse in institutions. These things are critical to reconciliation and healing, but they are also important to restitution and restoring practices. It's part of a retelling of history that is transparent, but also takes in the complexity of, life, of the lived experience of those subjected to this history. And the lived experience of those who committed these acts of violence and discrimination. In, in many ways, we need to know more about these lives on both sides to understand so that truth can be told, told and Australia can bear witness to that truth telling. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that um, really fabulous presentation, Patrick and Eleanor. And really what's clear from all three of the presentations we've had this morning is that we continue to deal with the consequences of the Saniographer's legacy um, in all of the issues that continue to um, unfold. And so the urgency of addressing it really is um, very, very important. So. Um, anyway, we can now go to questions. So I'd really love to hear from members of the audience who've been uh, noting down questions on the way through. Something I was really intrigued by, um, Jonathan, was the fact that the press of the time, um, you know, the Brisbane Courier, obviously were putting pressure on Griffith about that silence and complicity in a way that we probably may not get from the media <laughs> these days. Um, was that the case? It's fascinating. The Telegraph is the government paper and it's defending Griffith constantly. The Courier and the Figaro um, are attacking Griffith, but there's always this, this is normal. Um, it's all right to kill black people. So it's really fascinating that these papers can be quite racist in, on their front cover and then in, inside the stories. But they, uh, the Courier and the Figaro and the Queenslander, and, and that's where Carl Fieldberg is so important, they, they really keep reminding Queenslanders, these are human beings. You, you can't treat one lot of people as subhuman. There's a, there's a whole project, there's a multiple theses in looking at um, how the media talked about frontier violence and I'm, I'm not aware of anything being done on that as yet. There's, there's your first project for you to supervise, Fiona. There was a question. Uh, yeah, just a quick question for Kevin. I, I had the um, good fortune of going to the Oshma Peace Memorial. Mm -hmm. Sure, you've been there, but um, it's it's a very moving, quick installation, and I, a lot of the themes that read through that memorial uh, struck a chord with me as to the way in which uh, Aboriginal people in Australia have been confronted with this invasion, uh, and I, I recommend that if you get the chance. We, th th that neuro, I was going to say that neuro project I mentioned that's um, part of that is the repatriation of ancestral remains back into Australia. Mm -hmm. It's the first time, and it's on the, the main axis between Old, old Parliament House and the Wall. Mm -hmm. Do you mind speaking up a bit, please, Kevin? Sorry? Would you mind speaking up a bit? Oh, sorry, Bob. So um, it's become a personal conversation. Yeah, sorry. Right. Pointing that way. <laughs> so I mentioned that project Neuro, the one that's down in Canberra. So we've been shortlisted for. So that um, the significant part of that is a thing called the repatriation, National Re Repatriation Place. And it's for the return of ancestral remains that have been held in other institutions and brought back. It's on the main axis. It's just down from the old Parliament House and going up. Uh, it's on the edge of the lake and then facing the wall. And wall. It's, a, it's a really compelling project because we can't find another repatriation project to look at. And we don't know if it's about being 
funeral-like or memorial-like or monumental or it, it's a really big, a big issue about what's the character we're trying to, to capture in this thing. Because ultimately when we've looked at people who've gone through that trauma, well, if you go through the trauma of a funeral, you go through those stages of healing and grief and whatnot, but when an ancestral remain is presented to you and you've never gone through those stages, it's like, well, at which point, and ha at which point might people be at when they're confronted or come back into contact with these remains? And architecturally, how do you um, make the correct setting that has the has the right feel? I guess. Beautiful garden. Yeah, so the, the gardens rain, unfortunately, and you get wet. So we've got to we've got to protect these remains. So there's a there's a built significant built part of this, and it's a it's a, it's a big challenge. I don't know how to do it. I, I do know how to do it because I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's difficult because we don't know where to look for, for reference. There's a question there in the bedroom. Yeah, I was just going to ask: Does anyone um, have a proposed site for the museum? Of, mm -hmm. um, Yes, in central Queensland. But, where, but is, there a, is there a place of significance that... There's a, there's a thousand massacre sites in central Queensland. <laughs> and that's, that's where they're looking for. Yeah. They just wipe people out. Mm -hmm. and the, hot, the largest battalion of, um, of native troopers was just north of Wakhan. <laughs> Another question up the back. Um, I was at the ACES conference on last week and they had a little statement there with the actual things to proceed. And it brought up a few interesting conversations from pro and anti. So we're at the, the crux of this new government and their backing of it, so to speak. Is this a pinata sort of conversation of, you know, we're blind, we're fitting our things on this sort of thing? and redoing something that Sultan Ali Griffith in his time was doing because that's what he did in his day. Mm -hmm. Question, I don't have the answer, but question, mm -hmm. what do you think in relation to where we're at as a society? It's a good question, I think. It's, um, and I, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that either. Um, but I, I'm aware of the different debates and the different views about it. I mean, in some ways, I think it's really good that it's it's been brought forward. It's been actually talked about, and I think that's important. It's the same as you know this forum today, where we get to talk about these really difficult and complicated um, issues. So, but I don't, yeah, I don't know maybe the owner has a view, or someone else here has a view about. I did have a view, like as a 12 minute presentation was my view. Mm -hmm. It's important to have this conversation and it's important that it's Indigenous led at this point in time because no one else is initiating the conversation. If I hadn't stuck with this for two years, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today discussing this. It's only through my sheer determination to have a one day symposium that we are having a voice and different people are putting in their, uh, from their areas of expertise, what they consider. And I think it's important to talk historically about the frontier wars in this country. And that's why I've been working with historians like, Ken, uh, like Raymond Evans, where he had the conversation, it's filmed in a film called A Quintessential Act, where he talks about 95% of Queensland's Aboriginal populations were decimated by the frontier wars. The whole time I've been teaching here at this university, that's not being taught in the curriculum here. And through me being an artist, I can use my art as a platform to raise those issues. Well, just quickly on the destructive narrative, is there a goal with that narrative if that was to be hypothetically achieved and you kick the boxes? What is the narrative that's not destructive? Basically? Well, the way forward is somebody like Kevin O'Brien who is offering an alternative. 
through the architecture and the work that he's doing to say, yes, we can come to a purpose-built um, monument or place and reflect. And those examples he showed, you know, the, the Berlin Museum, I've been to that place and I've been to one of the most um, memorable, striking, hard-hitting pieces of public art where you cross the room from, from this side to that side, but to get to the other side, you have to walk over 10,000 metal plates. And in those 10,000 circular metal plates are people's faces. And, that, and the sound that you make clinking across that room is the resonating of all the bodies that were killed in the Jewish bodies killed in the Second World War. Mm. We don't have any memorial in Australia like this. That's why I showed John Mundine's The Aboriginal Memorial that would come closest to it, 200 hollow log coffins. We need strong symbolism, national symbolism, and we need to do it here in Queensland because of the level of destruction that happened here. So I'm tr I, you know, I think big, and that's why every person speaking today on the panel is an important voice in this conversation. Do you think, Kevin, through the work of embedding agency for um, Aboriginal communities and Indigenous people in the work you've done, does that create more ownership of those spaces in your experience? Oh, absolutely it does, yeah. Otherwise, I'm just operating as a slightly fascist architect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's that's really good. Right? There's another question up the back there. You asked my question. Um, if anyone's been to Berlin, they might see the small bronze plaques outside of the house mm. where a Jewish person has died, mm -hmm. and the small amount of detail that is there dictating where they went to what was their demise. And it's a very powerful mm. message and it's for every single one of them. And that could be the type of thing which could just be right across the country. Small, everyday reminders. Can I just, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Can I just add something on this point while I'm right on it? Uh, and I'll be covering a little bit in my presentation later. Uh, one of the roles I've, uh, I've got at the moment is this Consumer Council assisting the Mineral Truth Telling Justice Commission in Victoria. And what we're looking at is regional truth telling where we unpick the way in which uh, each region has been uh, invaded and people have been dispossessed and the economic consequences of that. And my view is that once, once we've concluded that, that truth telling, fact finding mission from that region physical regional museum that would be constructed with those facts and artifacts uh, on display firmly so that the locals cannot retract from it. Because that's what happens. Mm. People mm. retract to their positions of comfort mm. and, and w without these public uh, facilities, structures in, in their place telling them that no, you can't, cannot go back and hide behind this John Howard's, uh, you know, a, a largely peaceful settlement. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, they will, they will do it. Mm. The, the Daly Telegraph and Andrew Bolt and keep keep allowing them to be comfortable in in, in their undermining of the, on, of the condition. So I think yes, there needs to be an, a, a, a big uh, frontier war museum, but there needs to be in this truth telling process. It's going to roll out across the country really localised reminders for everybody of what happened. Can I add something to that idea of the, uh, the plaques? And uh, my colleague David reminded me of this. Frontier violence killed people. Mm -hmm. Removals killed generations of people. Mm -hmm. And the removals in Queensland happened fairly well after Griffith's time. Whether Griffith actually played any part in that is a, something we need to look at. But the removal of Aboriginal people from country happened in the early decades of the 20th century. And we haven't even talked about the men who were in charge of the Queensland government 
who authorised those removals? Meston. No, no, Meston is just a, he's a tiny player. It's the Home Secretaries who actually mm -hmm. sign off on the removal orders. And it's quite sad that, um, yes, it's great we're looking at frontier violence, but we're forgetting about removals, which is part two of the genocide. And and you could argue it's continuing with um, the removal Absolutely. currently of yeah, children of through child does. safety. So it's no, we, there's a yeah. lot of names. <laughs> that and that's could that, you know, what you're saying, because the white people I talk to in country Queensland who say, I've never seen an Aboriginal person here that proves they never lived here. There, there are other black people though that I've, that I've come across in, from time to time who, are, who know about what's happened on their land, in their land, <laughs> and, and are uncomfortable with it. And, yeah. and mm. are looking for the opportunity to mm. unburden themselves. Mm. And mm. if done well, yep. these truth telling processes will kill them. Mm. Yeah. We've got time for one more question. The gentleman on the end. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is probably too big to solicit answers for, but I'll keep it going anyway. Um, I was wondering if, if the panelists could um, reflect on um, this, this relationship between the, the institution as a kind of partner facing um, and its sort of duty to, um, to, to, reckon, to reckon with its. With its parts, but the university then, as a you know, as the day to day practices, um, and, and the extent to which we can kind of achieve that reckoning in the context of a neoliberal university sector, um, which is very much geared towards uh, a, a, you know highly functionalist employee, employee, employee mm -hmm. focused curriculum, um, which doesn't attend to stuff that Fiona was just talking about, which is all about decolonising curriculum. So I guess, you know, can we really have a conversation about, you know, re rethinking uh, uh, Griffith's um, history and future without attending to um, that problem of um, colonial thoughts or colonial knowledge still structuring the way that the university is mm -hmm. And Kevin, I'm really excited to see your political nature mm -hmm. materialise. I think if we were both, uh, they will inform each other, but I think the, the, the Labor government's commitment to the Makarata Commission and the truth telling process is coming and Griffiths is going to be exposed in a way. Mm -hmm. Most of get in there, it's my view. And I yeah. guess we're doing it today. <laughs> it's the, like, thanks to Fiona, we, we are starting that conversation. So, I mean, it, it will be. I imagine quite hard for the university to go forward and ignore today. I'm, I'm assuming. Oh, I think they can. It's not as if there's, there's a lot not of this a yeah. yeah, but there are well, conversations within the law school. So, and I've got a couple of colleagues here. Um, you know, and, and it's good to put people together, and, and the more people. Who are connected on on this, you know, topic and, and pushing it forward, the the louder and the larger the group becomes. So yeah, absolutely, I, mm -hmm. I think also, you know, in in the learning about uh, Samuel Griffith in this process, it the, the impact of Samuel Griffith is, is is quite wide in terms of its impact on on non-Indigenous Australians as well, in his work uh, and uh, both. Um, you know, some of the uh, things that are legacy in law at the present that disadvantage a number of groups. So I think building that conversation in, you know, student population, staff population and the community in general is, is part of that process. How do we make sense of some of the things we're really um, struggling with at the moment in, in law and reform? Uh, such as the, the, the criminal code. I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you all this, but um, Queensland history is no longer taught in any university in Queensland. Uh, that's, that's a tragedy. Um, I think it's criminal. I'd <laughs> go much further than tragedy. I would say that the universities who have systematically 
removed history from 